So hello, everyone. I just want to start this by saying that I hate emails. Before tech, I worked as a corporate lawyer. And in my law practice, I found that emails and direct messages were, first of all, very stressful and also prohibit, prohibited me from doing deep concentrated work. So I would sometimes go into a meeting and I found it incredibly rude when people are talking to you and they're like, wait, sorry. And then answering their phone and not even able to do like a five minute face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and this multitasking, I think is just not the best way, the most efficient way to work. Um, and so before I came to school, I, feel, I felt like my whole day was spent in my inbox responding to urgent requests. And I really struggled prioritizing the most important strategic work uh, due to these distractions. And I don't think I'm the only one. So if we switch to the next slide, I, I found a few studies uh, that confirmed that digital interruptions are a productivity hindrance. So a typical office worker is interrupted every 11 minutes, uh, while it takes around 25 minutes to return to the original task after an interruption. Ringing phones and email alerts lower IQs by 10 points, and knowledge workers average 20 hours a week managing email. And I don't know if you're like me, I feel like I have the worst attention span and Zoom has only worsened this. Um, and there's a study for that if we switch to the next slide. Um, so a study found that employees sent 5.2% more emails a day and emails had 2.9% more recipients during the pandemic's early weeks. So my research is really focused on productivity tools. So not just email, um, you know, Google Hangouts, Slack, uh, any direct message you have in your organization and whether they actually drive productivity or simply makes us feel busier at work with little productivity gain. Um, so this is meant to be action oriented and will provide solution as to what we can do about it. Unfortunately, I didn't find the silver bullets, uh, but I'll be very interested to hear about uh, your, your ideas at the end if you have any. Um, so how I approached the problem was really to look at three different categories and these categories would come back over and over again. So if we switch to the next slide. The first, of, the first one was really to look at the design of these tools. The second one is to audit an organization's infrastructure and ecosystem of product, productivity tools. And lastly, thinking about company culture and employee workflow. So in terms of design, I'm sure that you've felt this before. You're kind of going to your inbox just to see if there's something waiting for you there. Um, or you see that notification on your phone during class and you can't not look at it or you're always refreshing Slack to make sure that their little green icon um, is green. And I, I've talked to a lot of people and basically there, some people are telling me, why am I you know, liking every post on the public Slack channels? Why am I sending memes on Slack? And it's designed to keep user engagement high um, and it's designed to keep you there and kind of make you addicted to it and such as social media. Um, so I feel like these tools, are meant to be used, obviously, but they're also trying to keep us there as long as possible in the day. And lastly, on design, what's really interesting is that um, earlier this week, this year, we heard about uh, Microsoft 365 that introduced a productivity score. So basically, it was a score of like the time you, you spent on team, and um, metrics were like meetings, content collaboration, mobility, endpoint analytics network connectivity, but nothing was really tied to the quality of the work, unfortunately. And I think that's kind of the issues with, with these tools where it's designed to keep you on, but it's not designed to reward quality work, you know? Um, so that's kind of the first uh, part of the problem. And unfortunately for this part, you'll see I don't have recommendations. Um, I'm not going to go work at Slack or, um, or Microsoft, unfortunately, but if you do, uh, let's talk. Um, in terms of the infrastructure and ecosystem, uh, there's a quote at the end uh, of this slide that says that, that was about um, an accountant that was saying that what they do that's horrible is that they've moved from Slack to Teams, but they also have Googling out. And with email, they now have a total of three different message streams. And, you know, tomorrow we'll hear about Alex Becker and product led growth, which has been the driver of innovation in a number of organizations. But the downside is a proliferation of tools that are rarely retired. Um, and so 
software tools have kind of fallen in a trap and the employees are like, wait, what should I use to communicate? So people are going to send an email, then they're going to call you, then they're going to send you a DM to see if you've looked at your email. And as a worker, you kind of have to check all these things. Um, so as organizations pile on productivity and communication tools and features, are they really looking at what's more efficient or are they just piling on? And lastly, the third um, area that I, was that I was looking into is culture and workflow. So if all of your colleagues are on Slack and email, um, and if you have to be responsive, your workflow is in your email, how can you ever concentrate on work? And Cal Newport, a Dartmouth undergrad, uh, wrote a book um, called A World Without Email. And he calls this the hyperactive hive mind where it's a workflow centered on ongoing conversation fueled by unstructured and unscheduled messages. So basically he's saying that we're working in this, we have this workflow that has never been optimized and email was perhaps not meant to be this way, but now we're constantly working in our inbox. And, and in certain organizations, what's happening is that being responsive is more valued than being thoughtful. And that's a behavior that's rewarded. Um, and a lot of apps are trying to solve certain problems, Calendly, Doodle. Um, you know, some people will say like, look at your emails once a day, but these things don't stick because your workflow is in your email. Um, so that was kind of the third, uh, third bucket I was looking at when, when thinking about the problem. So uh, this is nice, but what can you do about it? You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna be a CEO next year, so I can't make like a top-down change and ban all emails. Um, but how can, you know, MBAs returning to the workforce affect change in their organization and still be responsive while carving out time for concentrated work? So um, I categorize um, ideas and solutions into two categories, um, the ones around culture and workflows and the other one around infrastructure. So if we switch to the next slide, um, I'll go one by one. Um, so my first advice would be, or solution would be to set standards and expectations. So discuss, discuss and agree on communication protocols in your team and be consistent. So how are you gonna communicate and when? Um, if reevaluate these modes of communication often and and, and be clear with your team when you're doing concentrated work and ask them not to interrupt. Um, the second one, very easy, everyone can do it, remove all notifications. So in computers, smartwatch, smartphone, and voluntarily check your emails and instant messages at a time that it's convenient for you. So for me, like when people say like, I look at my emails once a day, I know this would never work for me, but it can be, I look at my emails every 30 minutes, just like if I'm doing something, I won't let it interrupt me. And Obviously, if certain notifications are time sensitive, you can create rules so that like really important thing can get to you. Um, the third one is looking about workflows. So Cal Newport uh, suggests looking at the workflows in your emails and automating certain tasks that as long as it's not disruptive to your colleagues. So for example, if you always have back and forth about a report that's due every month, Maybe you can tell your colleagues like, hey, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. it's gonna be in our shared folder and you can take it from there and then add your comments on Thursday, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna finalize it. So like that, you're cutting a significant uh, amount of email back and forth. Um, the, fourth, the, the, the fourth one is a little harder maybe to implement as MBAs, but focusing on uh, output and quality of work rather than um, FaceTime or online presence as a performance metric can be really interesting. And I feel like if you trust your team um, and trust their work output, you know, the green bubble on Slack maybe isn't as relevant um, as it should be. Um, uh, after we have importing certain concepts from Agile, so what I found really interesting, and I talked to some people who do Scrum and Agile is some extreme programmers don't even have access to email. So I was like, oh, maybe Agile is kind of the, the silver bullet that we needed. Unfortunately, again, it depends on the culture, but I do think that certain concepts of, such as a daily stand-up meeting um, or different things that they do when they do uh, sprints could really cut a, a, a significant, significant flow of emails. 
Then we have getting to the point and be concise. So we know marketing studies have shown that certain language tactics can improve click through. So if you use I versus we, uh, some people are more radical. They're saying like email should be like a text message. So they limit themselves to a few sentences. But if you're crisp in your email and you're clear, you're gonna again like cut a, a, a lot of back and forth because there's a lot of ambiguity in, in emails. People read it, you know, when they're on the go. So if you're clear and short, um, maybe people won't need to um, email you back. And lastly, managing your time. Um, so studies have shown that people have difficulty understanding the passage of time, especially when using social media. Uh, so if you're going on Slack or email, maybe put a timer and just make sure that uh, you're not sucked into a Slack rabbit hole for longer than intended. Um, so these are the culture or more workflow uh, solutions. And then if we switch to the next slide, we have the infrastructure. Um, so the first one would be to choose the right tool for your team and sticking to it. Organizations sometimes have like a multiple of tools you can use. So I think being clear from the get-go and making sure you're consistent. The second, this is more maybe for people in IT or, or management positions, but um, do an audit of your productivity tools or even just the tools that your teams are using and, and figure out which one can be sunset. The added benefit would be to um, reduce costs. Um, and another one, retiring channels, team sites, um, you know, these things add up. Sometimes things are not used, so just retiring them, uh, deleting them can, can just avoid this infrastructure uh, problem. And, and lastly, this is really more for professional services, but a, a lot of times what happens in a professional services firm is that, you know, you have the lawyer or the consultant, and then they deal with HR, IT, finance, and all of these, um, all of these support functions have, you know, different workflows. So it's like, oh, if you have an IT request, you need to fill out this form. If you have an HR request, you need to email them on this platform. But no one really thinks about the person at the core of the business. So maybe appointing someone to look and streamline at the infrastructure around the professional or the knowledge worker can really improve their, um, their productivity. And so I hope this was helpful uh, and I would love uh, to hear about your experience or any questions. Great, great job, Elise. I love that quote, email's not a job because it sometimes feels like it can be a full-time job in and of itself. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious how much you um, found leadership to matter here and sort of how leaders model and the right behaviors when it comes to communications. Yeah, so I talked to a lot of people and people are like, yeah, this is life. Like we have email, we're stuck with it. So it's a little discouraging at times. Um, so what I found was, I feel like leaders sometimes are like, well, what I do to manage my own time is I like, tell my team to do this or that. So I feel like when you're at a certain point in an organization, you probably get less emails or can like tell people not to email you. Um, so that's kind of hard. And that's also what Cal Newport in his book, that's really interesting. And he's saying like, you know, Ford completely uh, reinvented the assembly line, but no one like is reinventing the workflow of people working in their emails. It's so, like the person who's gonna nail this will be very rich at some point or this organization will be very efficient because you know, if you're manufacturing, you're going to look at your workflows, but, you know, we're all working with our brains. We're intelligent people with higher education degrees, and we can't even figure out, like, how to work during our day. It's, <laughs> it's mind-blowing. Yeah. All right, questions. Uh, Alex Becker, I believe you're up first. I can't hear you. Alex, we can't hear you. Nope. You're unmuted, but your microphone's off. Yeah, okay. Okay, we're going to go next. Who's next, Patrick? Uh, Hugo, Hugo, you're up. Sure. Um, thanks a lot, Elise. That was, a, that was an awesome presentation. So I really liked your point about companies not retiring their legacy systems and therefore just having communication tools piling up. And I was wondering, before there's this cultural change that we're talking about, do you think that a temporary solution could be some form of consolida consolidation tool? Like we kind of have this for customer data, right? Like you're gonna have a tool that just brings all of your customer messages all in one place, so it's easier for everyone. 
do you think that this could work as well for internal communications? So you would have like one software that just brings your emails, your Slack messages, your phone calls all in one place. I think that would be great. And I think probably with Zoom and Teams, it's maybe a little more streamlined. The thing is, who's going to initiate this? It has to come from the top or it has to come with someone with like a lot of credit in the organization. Otherwise, like, you know, you work in IT and you're like, let's retire. I don't know, like Slack. No one's going to follow. And especially in a professional services firm where you have, you know, so many teams working on, on different platforms. I feel like it's going to take a lot. Of, I think it, that's the way to do it. But I think it's going to take a lot of political credits at the organizational level to make that happen. Uh, let's go to Arlene and then we'll come back to Alex Becker. Arlene. I feel really empowered that our product led growth um, expert is muted right now, but I'm just kidding, Alex. Um, so when we think about like these, these products that are selling productivity tools that are kind of gold on like more onboarding more and more people onto platforms are no doubt like selling to people that don't necessarily need them. Right. So when I think back to like my summer, at a startup, like a lot of times we were in the beneficial position of companies pitching to us in terms of like, please use our platform. And while we were in a stage where we were trying to understand like, what is our process for like planning out a go to market? What is our, what is our process for like task management? We were in this position where like, we wanted to test all these tools and like the Alex's of the world wanted to sell us all these tools. Um, so I guess like my question is if you were in the position of building like a communication system from the ground up at your company if you were ceo tomorrow um like what would what what would that look like would it be like one tool for productivity one tool for communication um would love to hear kind of like your thoughts of like having talked to all these people like we know like less is better um what would that look like to you yeah that's a sorry alex that's a very good question. Um, obviously, I think it. I think that what's holding a lot of people back is when people are client facing and they have clients emailing them because they're always going to say like, "Well, I need to be responsive to my clients." So I feel like it's not really the tool. I feel like it's more the culture of when you respond and how. Um, so depending on your business model, I think I would try to have like, <laughs> probably try to look at like different things that we can use and then really stick to it like our, your customers know how you're communicating your teams know your leadership knows and i feel like that's how and then training people on it because what happens is that like okay we got slack now you can use it but like like we use email every day like 20 hours a week but no one is ever trained on it so it's kind there's kind of a disconnect so i feel like it's not as yeah the tools are very important and there are so many great tools i think it's like pick one and make it work for your team but it's more the culture and being consistent and and really using it for the right purpose and that might mean like no emails at all in a company only slack or but also knowing when is it okay to dm someone or when can you email someone yeah that's definitely so interesting because i feel like when email i mean when email came about um, I feel like it just drove a behavioral change directly. Like, I wonder if there's going to be something that comes in that like breaks that. Thank you. Well, I think like people who are on it, honestly, I thought um, Agile was one of it just because they're like so organized, but it's obviously much more nimble teams. Uh, but like extreme programmers, sometimes there are two on a computer and people work like four hours a day and then they're so tired and they go home. So I think maybe they're onto something there, but it would take so much change management and like, you know, other companies to to implement. Alex Becker, we're we'll come back to you now. Can can folks hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, well, okay. So I'll start off by saying, in my own defense, I, I definitely don't advocate for selling people software that that they don't use and makes them less productive. That is that is not a long term strategy for success. Um, but at least this, this was awesome. And I think it raises a really interesting point. Um, and I'm curious kind of in your research, this question of when to sunset a product is, is a really interesting one and who makes that decision? Because, you know, like on the surface, we'd make the assumption that, you know, oh, like if people are using a product, then there's value there and, and we should keep it. 
Um, but there are also tons of examples of products that people use like way past when they should just because they're used to them and, and happens to be around. Um, and and uh, someone from the top probably should come in and say, all right, we're not using this anymore. It's, it's you know, wasting our time. And so I'm curious in your research, did you dig into how companies make that sort of sunsetting decision or that decision to churn out of a product and what metrics they use? Because I don't think it's as simple as simply saying like, if people are using it, we keep it. If they're not, we're gonna get rid of it. Um, you know, case in point, Yammer, like at Tuck, like people are using Yammer, but that doesn't mean it's the right solution. Yeah, it, it's, so I don't have a specific answer for you. I think the most interesting conversation I had was with an alum. And basically was saying like the like software like proliferation problem is almost like the knowledge problem in a startup. You know, when you become so big that you don't know where the knowledge is almost and you don't know who has the information. So it's like a part when you grow like this and I feel like, and I'm not sure this is just an idea but maybe the solution is like when you reach a certain threshold of like apps, obviously I think finance can be a huge driver for this just from a cost perspective. But also maybe it comes from the top where like you make a decision on how you're going to communicate and everything or how you're going to work and everything that doesn't fall into this goes and it's more like a strategy function because it's much easier to say like this is a solution versus we're taking your your toy away you know um so i feel like that could be a solution but um i don't have any specific metrics unfortunately yeah it's 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 a tough one so patrick and i had a conversation actually earlier today about whether in the future companies will have almost like a chief productivity officer that takes sort of the like the procurement aspect of IT and the tech aspect of IT with some like behavioral psychology and sort of strategy that can make so if, for instance like that someone who can come in and say all right if we're buying slack we're getting rid of email and if we're keeping email we're not getting slack you know like um, rather than simply having these stacks sort of spring out of nowhere where you have different teams on different products. Um, because like a lot of, you know, IT thinking is cost, you know, security, technical implementation. It's not based on like, what does this actually do to the end user? And the problem is that your end user is a knowledge worker or a professional, and no one is really, you know, no one can infringe on their, the way they're working. So they, like as a lawyer, I'm not gonna listen to anyone telling me like, this is how you should organize your work. I'm gonna be like, no, I went to, you know, I went to school, I know what I'm doing. So like professionals are not looking into their workflows. And so they're just like being bombarded by information and in different apps and tools. And like, and IT can help them because like IT doesn't know what they're doing. So it's kind of like a weird, so you really, I like your idea of like a chief productivity officer, or like someone who's really gonna look at the workflow. Cause I, I, I think Cal Newport like nailed it uh, on that front. That just right. makes so much sense in terms of knowledge. Like I think part of the reason why we rely on email and on Slack and also on like proxies of productivity on email and Slack, like how many emails you send a day and whether the green light is on is because it's really, it's much harder to figure out like the key performance dimensions for a knowledge worker because that they're doing is just sort of on a different time scale and with different inputs and outputs that are hard to judge and attribute to individual people. And so I think like it is almost really interesting where without dimensions to really measure performance in an individualized way or attribute it, like we're stuck with all of these weird proxies that are productivity based that don't honestly make sense. Like, are you a better lawyer because you spend a million minutes on email? Maybe, probably not some of the time. Like. So I just think it'll be really interesting as organizations go forward and figure out like what are the right dimensions for success for knowledge workers in my industry, for my company. And I do think Agile is sort of premised around that, right? Like it's about getting to MVP and then continually shipping product. And it'll be fascinating to see like that works really well in software. I don't know how that works in like a legal case where I don't know if there's an MVP for, for like going to trial. Probably, I kind of hope not, but it would be interesting to think about like can that model defining success the way you want to define it and then building processes and evaluating progress along that be implemented in other knowledge-based industries? Yeah, and it's really interesting because you know we're all in business school. We had classes on Excel modeling, like you know, R, like all these platforms, 
how to do PowerPoints, but there's no class on email yet. That's what we're going to use the most during our day. That's like email and Slack. We're going to be like 20 hours a week in that. Like that's half of like a normal work week. There's like no word of email aside from like marketing, you know, marketing emails really in classes. Um, so like, I feel like it's kind of that, like no one is really focusing on it yet. It's like what you use the most. It's a dynamite point, Elise, because I think one of the things, so for fellows and for others on the, on the phone, like or on the call, the Zoom call, like you're about to leave and become leaders of people and the impact that you'll have on those people will be immense. And the main way that you'll impact them is via communications and managing them and their time. And so this stuff's really, really hard. I never have someone come back and say, you know, I wish I'd taken more classes on modeling or, you know, maybe modeling, but maybe, but not like, how do I build a better presentation, right? They always, alumni always come back and say, I wish I'd paid more attention to managing people and managing teams and organizations because that's the stuff that's really, really hard. So this is such an important part of it. And Alex Mullen, I know you, you, look, you have your hand up. I'll, I'll go to you. Uh, yeah, I just have a quick question. And I guess it's less of a question and more just me wondering if you have a thought on this, but I, I'm so curious how sort of expectations of productivity and connectedness are different across different cultures or in different working contexts, like from country to country. And I don't know, I mean, like, cause all my work experience has been in the US in pretty like similar work context. So I feel like I have a general understanding of like what people expect in terms of, you know, email response times and things like that. But I, I just think it would be interesting to think about like productivity tools and management like across cultures. I don't know if you like came across that in any of your research or if you've given some thought to that too. Uh, not really, I'm trying to recall like I think it's most mostly industry based. So, you know, if you're in programming, I think like programmers are really onto something uh, just because they need so much focus and they kind of, you know, so I think there is a point uh, in terms of culture, like France, for example, has this new law about uh, the right to disconnect. Um, and so like, is your employer like allowed to send you email when you're on vacation? I know like in the US, Ariana Huffington, for example, has Thrive Away where if you go on vacation, your inbox is disabled. Um, so I think it's like a lot of like organization based, but uh, some European countries are looking into like putting it into law. Uh, so I think that that's an interesting point and, and more and more the right to disconnect. And I think it's gonna even grow more with Zoom where people are saying that their work and personal life are blurred. Um, so that should be interesting too. Uh, Roderick, we have about time for just the last question here, Roderick, so you're, you're up. Yeah, I just want to like add, add on to like what Elise just said. It is different, I think, in different cultures because like if, whenever I used to work with Argentinians, if I sent them an email, they would come right to my office and say, why did you send me this email and just come to my office? And if I was sending it to like someone from Nigeria, then they would just shoot me a text message. So like the means of communication was really different. It was, it was really weird. So like I, I sometimes have, I sometimes struggle as far as like how do I respond and to who because I forget like where I'm at sometimes. So yeah. Yeah. Elise, great job. This was, I am sensing a lot of energy around this topic and maybe this is something we should try to explore in fairness. Uh, Elise did an amazing job. Elise and I reached out to Cal Newport to try to get him to see if he would come and speak at Tuck. He's just, and, and in very on brand Cal Newport way, he's like, I'm finishing up my book and doing some book events. I'm too, too worn out mentally, so I need to recharge, which I thought was an amazing way for him to respond and very much in line with his understanding of the impact that these things have. Uh, but kudos to Elise, she, she, she did a really good job with that pr project and, and in trying to, to, to help others with this. I think maybe there's something we should do about this. We should have a conversation or a debate or a discussion where we open it up and, and uh, we can advertise it on email, Yammer, Slack, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, some other in our newsletter, some other places, but um, Joe, Joe will Joe will handle the multi-platform communications for that. But Alex, yeah, yeah. I was, I was just thinking it could be almost cool to do. I don't think debate is the right word, but a panel where you get like like Professor Taylor, like some of the professors that do organizational psych or like managing people, managing organizations. Yeah. 
and then get someone like from Slack or, or whatever. And sort of, because I think they're, you know, it's like the, the sort of software people have their own discussions, like the psychologists have their own discussions, the sort of digital transformation folks have their own, but we very rarely like, like if I were working at Slack right now, like I, everyone in the company needs to have an answer to like, does your product actually make people more productive? And why do you think that? Um, but it'd be interesting to sort of juxtapose that with like, here's what an organizational psychologist thinks. I just want to say thank you to Ben, Alex, and Elise. You got, you all did a really amazing job and set the bar really high for the group that's going tomorrow. Um, so no pressure speaking of, you know, Alex and I know Roderick's on here and some others. Um, great job. Really appreciate the work that you've done. Really excited for tomorrow's sessions as well. Uh, we hope everyone can join us. It's on the, on the session tonight um, and look forward to it. Wonderful job. Everyone, you know, really, really stand up job. So thank you so much. <laughs>